Amen. Do you love the Lord this morning? Come on now, if you love him, can we stand on our feet? Let's give God a little bit of praise this morning. Come on, let's praise him. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Ain't he worthy of the glory? Ain't he worthy of the praise? Hallelujah, glory to God. Amen. If you got your hymn, I'll turn to page 393. Just to try to break the ice. I'm a little nervous this morning. Amen. And whenever I get nervous, I have to sing or something. So if I sound bad, just bear with me. Amen. But I'm going to try to sing this song. When we all get to heaven. Amen. I believe that's a good one. Amen. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, you prepare for us a place. When, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. And when we all see Jesus, we will sing and shout the victory. Church, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that we'll be. And when we all see Jesus, we will sing and shout the victory. We walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will over. Spread the sky But when traveling days are over Not a shadow, not a sigh And when we all get to heaven What a day of rejoicing that will be And when we all see Jesus We'll sing and shout the victory let us then be true and faithful trust in serving every day for just one glimpse of him in glory will the toys of life repay and when we go get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that we'll be. Come on, church, sing it. And when we all see Jesus, we will sing and shout the victory. Come on, one more time. Oh, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that we'll be. And when we all see Jesus, us, we will sing and shout the victory. Hallelujah. Somebody give God a hand clap this morning. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You can have your seat for a minute. Amen. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Amen. At Mount Zion this morning. I appreciate the Lord for what I already feel down in my soul. I'm nervous as I don't know what this morning. And I'm trusting that God's going to help us. Yeah. Amen. I just want to testify and tell what the God did for me. Uh, I've been praying for a vehicle. And I was needing something better on gas. And that truck boy was, I'm telling you, it was drinking gas. I tell you, and these gas prices was killing me. And I said, Lord, I need a vehicle. I need something to help me get the preaching appointments and things like that. And I went uh, two Saturdays ago looking at some vehicles, and I heard the Lord say, wait. And, uh, and I, I said, well, I'm going to go on back home then, I reckon. There was a nice, beautiful car there. And the Lord told me to wait. And on uh, that Monday, a man two hours away texted him and said, that, uh, I heard you was looking for a car, brother. I said, yes, sir. He said, well, I got some buddies down here. He said, we can go look and you know, see what they got. And I got down there, didn't know, you know, what the Lord was going to do. Brother Robbie didn't know what God had planned, but I was just going on faith, trusting him. 
I pulled up there and he, he said, Brother, he said, what kind of car are you looking for? I said, I, I said, maybe something like a Honda Accord. I'm a big fella, so I need some space. He said, well, he said, we'll see if we can find one. There wasn't one car, a Honda Accord, on that lot. And he called the boss man. The boss man wasn't even at work. He said, I'll have one in 30 minutes if you can just wait on it. And he pulled that, that, that blue Honda Accord, pulled up there at the front door, and it had a tag on it that said, this item is not for sale. And I said, well, I sure would have loved to drive that car home. The boss man come out, and he looked at me. He said, you like that car? I said, man, yeah, that thing's pretty. He said, well, take it for a test drive. See how you like it. I got in that car, and it was too nice for me. I didn't have enough money to pay for that thing. And I heard God speak to me while, while I was test driving, and he said, you're going to drive home with this car today. And I said, Lord, I said, I don't got a lot of money in my pocket for this car. I said, but Lord, I said, well, I trust you. See what happens. Went to talking to the salesman, and he kept shaking his head. He said, man, I don't know if you'll be able to drive home with it or not. I don't know. The man that called me, he was sitting right there next to me. He said, I want this boy to drive home in a Honda Accord today. He said, how can I get him to drive it home? Salesman said, well, with the way, you know, his income ain't too big because I'm a full-time student. He said, he's going to need a, need a big down payment for this car. He said, how big of a down payment? He said, as much as you can give. And I said, well, I said, I'm going to just drive on home with Big Red today. I'm going to just go on back to the house. But he called his secretary and said, bring me a check. And he wrote down a check for $15,900 to put down on that car. And I said, Lord, have mercy. And I had, I had a little bit in my pocket. And he said, brother, he said, I want you to take that money, take it back to the bank and put it in the bank in your savings account. I said, well, sir, $15,000. And the salesman said, that's not enough. He said, he still needs to drive home with insurance to be able to take it off the lot. And that man said, I want to pay for the first six months of his insurance. So all together, that brother paid $17,000 for me to drive home in a new car. And I appreciate the Lord for that. Some of y'all, you know, it may not mean much to y'all, but son, 24 miles to the gallon is a blessing to this preacher compared to 10 miles to the gallon. And a lot, a lot of people, they told me, they said, well, they said, you're probably going to have to trade in your truck to be able to get a new car. Well, I still got my truck at the house, and I still got a brand new car, so I appreciate y'all for what it done. Amen. Many people say, oh, that was man's doing. No, that wasn't man's doing. That was God's doing. That was all God. I give all the praise and glory to God. Appreciate you being here this morning. I just wanted to share that. I told the Lord I'd tell it if he did it. So he did it, so I told it. Amen. If you have... Oh, yeah. I, uh, I had drove my truck two hours there, and I, and I was trying to figure out how I was going to get the car back and how I was going to get my truck back at the same time. And the man that was with me, he said, uh, he said, you got your spare key on you? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, just go on home with your new car, and I'll have one of my employees to drop it off at your church tonight. So I was able to drive home that car, and my truck was already back at the house. I, I tell you, you can't outdo God. Now. You can't outdo God. You can't outdo God. Brother Andrew texted me uh, about a week ago, and he asked me to come. So please, if you can, help us this morning. I ain't going to be up here for two hours unless the Lord tells me. And I don't believe he'll tell me to be up here for two and a half hours. But if you have your Bibles, I'll be coming from Matthew chapter 27 this morning. Amen. So good to see all you beautiful people here this morning. God, so good to see you. I've been, I, ever since I've been in here, I've just seen everybody smile. I ain't seen nobody frown yet. Boy, I mean, y'all keep smiling. Y'all beautiful when you smile. Amen. Matthew 27. I'm going to be skipping uh, some verses here. I'm going to read the first two and I'm going to skip down to verse 11. Matthew 27. If you have it, will you say amen? amen? If you don't have it, say hallelujah, and I'll wait on you. Okay, I'll wait on you. Turn it there. Matthew 27. And the Bible says, When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Skip down to verse 11 with me. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? 
And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. Now at that feast the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Who are ye that I release unto you? Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ. For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Well, of the twain were ye that I released unto you. They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. I'm going to ask Brother Woodrow to pray for the, over the reading of his word this morning. Amen. Pray for us this morning. In the name of you can have your seat this morning. Amen. If I had a topic for this morning, it would be the sentence of a lifetime. The sentence of a lifetime. We read over this many times. I've, I've heard this story ever since I was born about Jesus being crucified for our sins. How much he loved us that he gave his very life just for us to have life. And I look at this, this judgment that's going on with Pontius Pilate. Many times I just, you know, read over it and then got to the, the crucifixion itself. But a few weeks ago, the Lord just started dealing with me about, amen, this judgment that was going on. To understand what Jesus is going through here, we have to go all the way back to the beginning of time. Where God is sitting on his throne, God has just always been. He never had a beginning, he'll never have an end. He's just always been and always will be God. But as he was just sitting there where he was, out of nowhere, he said, let there be light. Boom, and there was light. And he looked at the light and said it was good. I'm going somewhere. You just got to hold on with me just for a little while. He said, let there be light, and there was light. So he looked at the light and said it was good. And about this time, he started just forming all kind of things. He made the sun. He made Jupiter. He made Saturn, Uranus, all these planets. He opened up his hand, and all the stars were just put in the sky. And God just started looking and said, this looks real good. I might as well finish what I start. And he gets to this one planet that's different than all the other planets called Earth. And he sees the Holy Ghost moving upon the face of the water. And he starts speaking and all of a sudden trees start to grow. Grass start to grow. Mountains is formed and valleys is formed. And the sea and everything just is just coming together just like God is telling it to. And he said, let there be beasts that's running on the field. There go the dogs and there go the cows and, and the lion, all this stuff. God was speaking everything into existence. But there came a time where God was talking to Jesus. And he looked at Jesus dead in the face and said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Now if you look, God spoke everything else into existence. But when he got to mankind, he decided to do things just a little bit different. God Almighty got off of his holy throne and earth at this time there was no sin even thought of, so everything was holy. God got off of his throne and he went to the dust of the earth and grabbed it with his very own hands. And he took that dust and started putting things together and he put hands together. He put a face together. He put arms and legs and toes and everything. He just formed it just how beautiful that it was and he looked at that shell when it was nothing nothing was going on there was no life in that shell now God being God he could have said live and he would have got up and went to live he could have said let there be life and he would have went to live but God spoke everything else into existence but he wanted man to be different God almighty got down on his knees brother and he grabbed at him by the nostrils and the Bible said that God Almighty took his very own breath 
out of his lungs and breathed into him the breath of life and he became a living soul. Bible said that God made us just a little bit lower than the angels. Now when Adam was made, when Adam became alive, he had a 100% mind capacity. He knew everything. He knew what everything was and he knew who made everything. Come on and say amen. So he looked at this thing. He said it looked good and, and God looked at Adam and said it's not good for man to be alone. I must make him a helpmate. He takes a rib out of Adam, performed the first surgery and never even left a scar. He put a rib out of his side and he took a little bit more dust, Brother Woodrow, and he made woman because she came from man. Now they was walking around this garden. Everything was going good, but God said, you can eat of every tree, but the tree that's in the midst of the garden, do not touch it. That's all they had to do. If you do your research, they stayed in that garden for a minimum of 100 years. Living the way life was supposed to go out. Every day they would just walk around the garden worshiping God, eating of the trees. And God himself in the cool of the day would come off his throne and walk and talk with Adam. Can you imagine what it was like, church, to grab God Almighty by the hand and just walking through the garden with God? They just talking, just enjoying life with God Almighty. And there came a time where Eve was in the middle of the garden and here come the serpent trying to beguile her. He said, God said, if you eat of this tree, will you die? She said, God said, if we eat, we shall surely die. He said, but you shall not surely die. God knows you'll come liking unto him. Knowing the difference between good and evil. See, a lot of times, church, we get upset because we find ourselves in places that we have no business being. We find ourselves in situations and problems, and we're asking God, God, how in the world did I get to this place? It wasn't because of God, and it wasn't because of the devil. We just went in the wrong place when God told us not to be there. He said, don't you even go to the middle of the garden. Don't touch it. But she was looking at that tree. She grabbed that fruit and she added that fruit and went to Adam. And Adam, he took and he did it. And sin came into the world just that fast. And what's so amazing to me is even after the fact that Adam and Eve sinned, God Almighty still got off his throne looking for Adam in the cool of the day. He said, Adam, where art thou? He said, I hid myself. Because I was naked and ashamed. And I didn't want you to see me like this. He said, who told you that you was naked? Did you eat of the tree I told you not to eat of? He said, the woman that you gave me. Try to play the blame game. The woman you gave me. She had of it first. And she gave it to me and I did eat. He went to the woman, the serpent that you made. He beguiled me. He tricked me into eating of that fruit. Ever since that one piece of fruit was eaten, all the sin that we see now come from one piece of fruit. World War I come because somebody ate the forbidden fruit. World War II, coronavirus, diabetes, arthritis, cancer, all of this come because somebody ate one piece of fruit. But God didn't kill Adam and Eve after they sinned. He kicked them out of the garden. And he looked at him and said, be fruitful and multiply the earth. So now we see they have children by the name of Cain and Abel. The Bible said that Cain was a tiller of the ground. And Abel, he was a keeper of the sheep. And there come a time where Adam and Eve taught these boys how to give sacrifices to God for their sin. And no doubt Adam told them, you got to have some blood. You got to have some blood. Abel was looking over his sheep and he went to every sheep he had, I believe. And he'd pick up one and it had a broke hoof. And he said, no, that's not good enough. He went to one that had a black spot on his shoulder. No, that one's not good enough. I got to find one without wrinkle. I got to find one without a spot and without a blemish because this is a holy God and I got to give him every bit of me. I got to give him the absolute bet. Come on now. But Ab Cain said, I'm going to look for another alternative way to see if I can get forgiveness for my sin. He went to the ground and got a piece of fruit. It was a curse, brother. He brought it before God. God rejected Cain. And his offering. But he accepted Abel and his offering. 
Cain got so mad with his brother that he killed his brother. He said, why in the world, why is your countenance falling? Why are you so upset? I told you how you got to live. I told you what you got to do, but you tried to find another way to get to God. We're living in a world now, church, they're trying to find every other avenue to get to God Almighty. But John 10 and 9, Jesus said this. He said, I am the door. He said, no man cometh to the Father except by me. He said, any other way is as a thief and a robber. We live in a world, Brother Robbie, they're trying to get in through the windows. They're trying to get in through the back door. But there's no other way to get to the Father but by the Son. Come on, say amen. If you want all of God, you've got to go through a man named Jesus Christ. You've got to give him your life. You've got to give him everything. That's the only way to get to God. But Cain tried to find another way. And he couldn't even find it. So now we see that God's talking to Cain. Says, where is your brother? He said, am I my brother's keeper? Am I supposed to know where he is? All day, every day, getting smart with God Almighty. But he said, listen, do you hear what I'm hearing? I hear his blood calling out to me from the ground. When I read that scripture and I found out that God needed blood for remission of sin, Hebrews said, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. I found out that day, brother, that there's, there's got to be life in the blood. Blood's just not another liquid like water or tea or anything of that nature. Amen. Blood is different. There's life in the blood. You may say, well, how is that possible? Over in Exodus chapter 12, God is talking to Moses and said, I'm getting ready to bring, amen, death to the land of Egypt. He said, but there's one way that you can be saved from this death. He said, God, what do I got to do? He said, get you a lamb and keep him up. And he gave him all these many different uh, stipulations and things to do. He said, but when you kill this lamb, he said, take the blood and put it on the side post and put it on the lintel. And I, I know that Moses probably said, God, why in the world am I putting it on the door for? God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. The destroyer will not go into your household. What are you saying, preacher? I'm telling you today, church, we got to have the blood applied to our hearts. We got to have the blood applied in our mind because sooner or later, Jesus is coming back. The deaf angel's coming and he's looking to take everybody to hell with him. But I'm going to stand up for my family. I'm going to stand up for my friends. I'm going to be like Joshua said, ask for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. There's life in the blood. If we go back to the chapter before in Exodus 11, God told him, he said, around midnight, the deaf angel's going to come. And I wondered, I said, why didn't God just give them a specific time? And I said, well, it's just like the day and hour we're living in. Jesus told the disciples, he said, I don't know the day and I don't know the hour. But I'll leave one commandment with you. Be ye also ready. For the hour that you think not, the Son of Man is going to come. He said, I'm going to be like a thief in the night. He said if the man of the household knew what hour the thief was, he would have been up and he'd have been watching for him. He said, but I'm coming when you least expect it. When you think your life is going good, son of friend, and you say, I don't need God right now, everything's just going good in my life. I got a new job. I got a new house. I got a new car. Everything's going fine for me. Why do I need God now? Because there's coming a day, church. When he's coming back on that eastern sky and when he opens up that sky, if you're not ready and the blood's not applied, you will be left behind. There's life in the blood. So as we see that, that how important the blood was, now we get to where this, this story is coming from. As time went on, sin got worse and worse as from, from that time till Jesus come to the earth. And we see that Jesus is standing before, amen, this, this man named Pilate. And we see that Jesus is sitting there and he's not saying a word. He just said two words just in that little bit of time. He said, thou sayest, that's all he said. But there came a prophecy over 500 years before Jesus came on the earth. He said, a son is coming. 
Isaiah chapter 9, he said, His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. He's coming, and you better be ready when he comes. About that time an angel comes to Mary and says, You are highly favored among all women. You're going to conceive a son. You can hold this baby. You can clothe this baby. You can feed this baby. But you just can't name this baby. You mothers know what it's like when you get, you know, when you expect and you're thinking about the gender. You find out if it's a boy or a girl, then the first thing that comes, what are we going to name the baby? What are we going to name this baby? You're going through a long list, going through all kind of different middle names and first names, and you're saying Jeffro, and I mean, nothing don't make sense, and you're just like, okay, well, I got to figure out a name. But Mary could do everything for this baby, but she just couldn't name this baby. I believe that angel of the Lord told her, listen, this name has been used for generations and will be used generations after he is gone. Amen. This name has been given to him before time was even thought of. His name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. Amen. Mary sees this baby boy, a beautiful baby. He didn't even have clothes. The Bible said that they wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Nothing but rags. That's all that God had. That's all that Jesus had. But it didn't change his mind to come down to an old lowly manger. He came in an old stinking stable. He didn't even come to the palace. But he said, it's not going to change my mind. I got a love greater than every other love. People will tell you there's no love greater than mama's love. There's no love greater than daddy's love but I beg to differ I found one love that's far greater than mama's love I found one love that's far greater than daddy's love it's a love of a savior that gave his life for you and I he gave his life for the atheist he gave his life for the alcoholic he gave his life for the drug addict he gave his life for you and he gave his life for me I'm so thankful that he gave his life for me I don't deserve his grace I don't deserve his mercy I don't even deserve his love but he still give it to us church he still gives it to us I gave God a billion reasons not to save me but not one of them changed his mind I lied before I've cheated before I've stole before I don't deserve nothing good from God but he gave his very son the atheist that says I don't even believe there's a God God still gave his son for the atheist. Hallelujah to God. She, he come forth. He was prophesied. And Hebrews chapter 10, we see that there's a conversation going on in heaven. Jesus said, listen, Father, and burnt offers and sacrifices, thou hast had no pleasure. He said, but a body thou hast prepared me. It is written of me to do thy will, O oh God. Brother Woodrow, how wonderful it was that Jesus was just sitting on his throne and he looked at the sins of mankind. But he looked farther down the road and he looked inside Mount Zion holding the church. And he saw some people lifting him up and giving him praise. And he said, there's one way that's better than the way this world's ahead. There's got to be a way. He paid the ultimate sacrifice. There came a man before him by the name of John the Baptist. And he told the world, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said, there's one coming mightier than I whose shoes I'm not even worthy to unloose. Oh, when he comes, he's bringing salvation. I baptize you right now with water. But when he comes, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. I can just imagine in my mind John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness and he sees a man coming down the road. Amen. And he looks different than all these other men. He's got a glow about him. And he says, Behold, the Lamb of God. He walks up to John the Baptist and he looks him dead in his face and says, John, you must baptize me. John the Baptist said, Lord, I'm not even worthy to take your shoes off. You're the one that needs to baptize me. He said, But no, you shall baptize me to fulfill all righteousness. Can you imagine with me church standing on the bank and you seeing the king of kings walking into the Jordan River that he himself created. He got in that water, amen, as a servant. He got dipped in and the Bible said that heaven opened up. And the Holy Ghost came down to sit on him like a dove and God Almighty said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Oh, 
this stuff was already planned. And it seemed like between the ages of 12 and 33, Jesus just went missing. But he lived every day between 12 and 33. Bible said in every way that we was tempted, he was tried. But he didn't even see it. He may say, well, God, brother, Jesus just don't understand. He does. He's been there. He knows what it feels like to be tempted. He knows what it feels like to be tried. But he said, I overcame the world so you can overcome the world. I know it's a little slow right now, but I'm getting ready to come to a close in a few minutes. Just, just bear with me. So we see here now Jesus standing in front of Pilate. And everybody that was once his friend, everybody that was once walking with him, everybody just turned their back on God Almighty. They was coming up with accusations, trying to find a way to kill him. Pilate said, I find no fault in this man. I've searched him up and down. I've heard all the stories, but I still can't find no fault in this man. His own wife come to him and said, baby, don't you have nothing to do with that just man. I've suffered many things in a dream because of him. There's nothing wrong with that man. He's pure. He's holy. I don't even know. There's no sin in him. Leave him alone. But he knew that the crowd was getting too much. And he said, I'll figure out a way. He said, it's time for me to release a prisoner under you. And the Bible called Barabbas a notable prisoner. Everybody knew Barabbas. And when they stood before the people, he said, who are you that I release unto you? Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ. The crowd said, give us Barabbas. That sounds familiar today. America is crying, give us Barabbas. We don't want nothing to do with Jesus. Nothing to do with this man. He deserves death, but he didn't do nothing but love those people. He didn't do nothing but have his arms outstretched for those people. But they're saying, give us Barabbas. Barabbas was a killer. He was a murderer. And they said, we'd rather have a murderer loose in the streets than have the king of kings and the Lord of lords. This wasn't the first time, church, that Jesus stood before a judge. This was not the first time. I prayed about this thing, and it's like God showed me a courtroom. And on the throne, God Almighty is sitting on his throne. And the sins of mankind is at the stand. And justice and truth is on one side, and mercy and grace is on the other. Justice and truth said, man has sinned. Man has come short of the glory. Man has fallen. They deserve death. And they deserve hell. Justice and truth just tells you like it is. They deserve to die. They do not deserve love. They don't deserve peace. They don't deserve joy. But mercy and grace said, your honor, can I take the stand for me? Mercy and grace walks up and says, Your Honor, by one man, sin entered into the world. Could it possibly be by one man that sin can be taken out? That's all he said. The jury's over there talking, and they reach a verdict. They said, Your Honor, we'd like to go with mercy and grace but we just got one question for you. Who's going to be the man? Who is going to be the man? They leave out the courtroom. They go up into heaven. Couldn't find nobody. They went down into the earth. Couldn't find nobody good enough. Job, Noah, nobody was good enough. David, Daniel, nobody was good enough. And the whole time the answer was the bailiff sitting right next to the father. He's sitting there and he says, Father, if you prepare me a body, I'll go and redeem them from their sin. I'll go. 
God Almighty looks at him and said, don't you know? People's going to lie on you. Yes, Father, I know. Don't you know they're going to pluck the beard out of your face? Yes, God, I know. They're going to beat you with, with the cat of nine tails. They're going to crucify you. They're going to kill you. Father, if you make me a body, I'll redeem mankind from their sin. God looked at him and said, go. And the search went on, Brother Woodrow. After he got baptized, God, Jesus went to doing exactly what he come to do, saving, healing, setting free, delivering the captives, making the lame to walk, the blind to see. Jesus just went on a mission. But when he got to this place and he was, was put to be crucified, he didn't say one mumbling word. The Bible called him. He was like a sheep born for the slaughter. He opened not his mouth. And I want you to imagine, sinner friend, Somebody that saw you in your mess. Somebody that saw you doing things you had no business doing. And I want you to hear something. I can't even get to it. Taking the beating that I deserved. Taking the stripes that we deserve. And he took them on his back. The very flesh from his back was being ripped off of him. Blood, life was going everywhere. But he said, I, he said, any time I can call 12 leaders of angels to come and get me out of here. He said, but I'm not going to do it. They beat him. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They mocked him. They blindfolded him and spit on him and said, prophesy. Tell us who spit on you. Tell us who hit you. Mocking Jesus Christ. He didn't do nothing but love him. He didn't do nothing but love him. Any point in time, he could have said, God, kill them all. He could have said, wipe them off. But he didn't. You know what he said? Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they do. Church, if we was being honest, Jesus gave everything for us. But it seems as if we only give him 10% of us. Jesus gave everything that he had. But then I think about that. He gave everything for me. Even when I didn't even love the person in the mirror, he still said, I love you. When mom and daddy didn't understand, the nights I'd cry myself to sleep, and nobody understood where I was. Jesus said, I understand. Amen. Some of you, you, you may have lived a harder life than I have. You may have been out there drinking. You may have been out there partying and doing drugs and all this other stuff, not loving, trying to take the pain away. But Jesus said, I still love you. Amen. You can't drink enough for me not to stop loving you. He said, there's only one sin I won't forgive you of, and that's blaspheming the Holy Ghost. In other words, you can kill a man and I'll still love you. You can steal from a man. I'll still love you. It don't matter what you did last night. He still loves you. It don't matter what you did this morning before you even got to church. You know what he said? I still love you. And on that cross, Brother Woodrow, looking at that God got us healed, took that cross and put it on his shoulders. And he walked to God got us healed. And he had you and he had me on his mind. I believe every step that he took, he thought about us. It says, just one more step. Just one more step. Oh, I see Rock and Bryce. I see James Paul and, and Amber. I see Woodrow Cooper. I see Chris Cummings. I see him. If I can just take one more step, I'll get there. He's laying on this cross at the top of the hill. Nails going into his hand. Nails going into his feet. They pick up that cross and he drops in this hole. Bible said not one bone of them was broken. But I believe that everything was out of joint. He hung on a cross for hours, gasping for air. If you could hear what Jesus was breathing like, it was... <sighs> Hours, he was like that. He thought about us. 
And even in his dying breath, the thief that was on the cross, one thief said, if you really are God, get us off this cross. If you're God, take get off the cross. Take us off with you. But the other thief said, listen, you and I, we deserve what we're getting. We deserve to die, but this man, he don't deserve nothing. He do not deserve nothing that he's getting right now. But you and I do. He looked at him. He didn't, he didn't come out with a big proclamation. He looked at him and said, Father, when you enter into your kingdom, will you just remember me? Father, will you just keep me in mind? When you enter into your kingdom, keep me in your mind. But I believe the whole time he was on his mind. And in Jesus' dying breath, he said, This day you shall be with me in paradise. Maybe in his mind he said, I don't deserve it. I know you don't deserve but mercy said, Oh, yes. Oh, yes. He gave his dying breath. Come to a point, he said, Eli, Eli. Lama sabach deny, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God that loved his son turned his back on his son because he took my sins and your sins and put it on his shoulders and nailed it to an old rugged cross. And after he said it is finished and he gave up the ghost, I believe that there came a time where the devil and death had a conversation. I can see the devil now looking at death. He didn't want him to raise from the dead. He didn't even want him going to the cross. But I can just see the devil talking to death and he says, listen, Jesus just came through your ranks. Do you got a hold of him? Death said, I got him. He ain't going nowhere. He said, now he said, in three days I'm going to rise. So I'm going to come back to make sure you still got a hold of him. The first day goes by. Jesus is still in death's hands. Death says, I still got him. He ain't went nowhere. Hold him. Hold him. Don't let him go. The second day comes. The devil says, do you still got him? I still got him. He ain't moved yet. I still got a hold of him. Hold him. We just got one more day. If he's dead for one more day, we won the victory. But I can just see the third day as the devil's going to where death is. He sees death running towards him and says, I don't know how to explain it. I don't know how to put it into words. But something happened early this morning. I can see the devil now. What happened? Somewhere around midnight, it just seemed like I just saw him moving. And God Almighty took at him and said, get up. And I, 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 I took everything I knew. I held him as tight as I could, but I couldn't hold him down no longer. He's alive, Satan. He's alive. Where's he at now? He's coming for you. I can see Jesus, Brother Chris, walking up to him. And he said, give me the keys. Give me the keys. Brother, Bible said in the third day he rose. Oh, power in his hand. He said, I was he that once was dead, but now I'm alive forevermore. And I got the keys of death and of hell. Oh, Lord, the devil's walking around right now and ain't even got the keys to his own home. But Jesus rose with all power in his hand. He paid the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. He paid the price for your healing. He paid the price for your children. He paid the price for your family. And he did it all with love. The sentence of a lifetime. They tried to kill him, but they found out they couldn't kill him. Death tried to handle him. Death couldn't even handle him. And the grave couldn't even hold him. 
Bible said that third day that Mary was coming to the temple or coming to the grave just to mourn. And when she got there, the stone was rolled away. And she looked in there and Jesus was nowhere to be found. And a man dressed in white said, who are you looking for? She says, I'm looking for Jesus. I'm looking for him. Where is he at? He's alive. He is alive. He's no longer in the grave. But he's sitting on the right hand of God Almighty making intercession for you and I. Somebody give him praise this morning. sinner friend, he loves you. He loves you. If you give me about 15 minutes, I'm a hush, I promise you. But I just want to talk to the lost man for a minute. Lost man, I love you today. I love you. If I could save you, I would, but I can't do it. The pastor can't save you. Mom and daddy can't save you. But there's one man who can there's one man who can. I want to ask you a question, sinner friend. What is it in this life that's got a hold on you that don't, that don't want you to get saved? What is it? Just think about it. If you would take that thought that's in your mind right now and put it next to a place that if you keep doing what you're doing, you'll end up in a place where there's weeping, there's wailing, there's gnashing of teeth. There's no way out of this place. And the small thing that you're doing right now will take you to that place. But Jesus made a detour for you to miss that place. Sinner friend, you are serving, a, you're serving something that don't even love you. Now, Jesus said this here. Listen, you may say, well, I'm not serving the devil. I'm just not saved. Jesus said, a man cannot serve two masters. He said he's going to love one. He's going to hate the other. And there's only two. That's the devil and Jesus. If you're not serving Jesus, you're serving the devil. What has the devil done for you that makes you want to stay with him? Has the devil ever paid your bills? Has he ever put food on your table? Has he ever held you while you cried? Has he ever walked with you in the doctor's office and the doctor said, I can't find nothing? The devil's never done none of that for me. i tell you what the devil will do. He'll give you a heartache. He'll give you pain. So you see the people there say, Preacher, I can't really sleep at night. He can't even give you peace to help you sleep at night. He can't give you nothing that's good, but there's a Savior. He said, I'm the Prince of Peace. Even when your world is falling apart, I'll give you peace to let you sleep right through it. Even when people say you should be losing your mind, you should be mad, sad, depressed, and blue, he said, I'll give you joy. He said, I'll give you love. I'll give you all. He said, I'll walk with you in the doctor's office. I'll, I'll put food on your table. They even said, I once was young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken. No, it's seed begging bread. He said, I'll feed you when you're hungry. I'll put clothes on your back. I'll put gas in those vehicles. He wants to take care of you. But you're serving a devil that don't care nothing for you. I want to ask you a question. Sister Rachel, if you'd come play for me. <clears throat> I want to ask you a question. If Jesus would come back right now, how many could truly say, I'm ready to go with him? I'm ready. I am. If Jesus would come back, there's coming a day where the rapture is going to take place. Yes, sir. Sinner friend, I want you just to take a glimpse or what would happen if you missed that notable day? You could be sitting in a church somewhere. You could be at home. 
We could be in the bed, Brother Chris. No man knows the hour. No man even knows the day. But there's coming a day where the news anchor is going to come on and say everybody has just went missing. Families is calling in. Mama's gone. Daddy's gone. I can't find them. I've called them. I can't find mama. I can't find daddy. I can't find grandma. Where's grandpa at? People's going to be looking. By knocking on the church door. Pastor, are you still there? The pastor's gone. Preachers, are you still there? The preachers is gone. Everybody who was ready is gone. You're talking about a day. The Bible said that, that God, he's got seven angels holding seven trumpets. They're going to blow those trumpets. He said, I even see a pale horse coming, which is death. And hell is following him. He said, in that day, people's going to desire to die. And death shall flee from them. In that day, people's going to try to kill themselves. Putting a 12 gauge right in their head. Pulling the trigger. And they ain't even going to die. But they're going to feel all the pain. Everybody knows. Once everybody's gone. Once Jesus come back. That's it for us. But while you got breath in your body right now, while you got blood flowing right now, why don't you come? Why don't you come? Jesus is standing outstretched right now saying, come. Come. See, the devil tell you right now, oh, everybody will talk about you if you go up there. I don't see nobody here that will talk about you. Matter of fact, if they want to talk, let them talk. You come and talk to him. And God will take care of them. If, you're, if you bow your heads all over that God's house this morning, if you're here today and you're a sinner, would you just slip up your hand and say, Preacher, I'm a sinner. Will you pray for me? Will you pray for me? I'm not going to embarrass you. We just slip, slip up your hand and say, Preacher, I'm lost. God sees that hand. Preacher, I'm lost. I need a Savior. I need a Savior. If you're here this morning, you'll backslide and say, Preacher, I know what it once was to be saved. I know what it was like when you slip your hand and say, Preacher, pray for me. God knows. God sees. If you're here today and you're a Christian, say, Preacher, I got lost loved ones. I got some things I need God to help me with. Will you slip up your hand and say, Preacher, just remember me. God sees these hands. He sees these hands. He sees these hands. <clears throat> Sinner friend, would you come and let God save you this morning? It would be the best decision you've ever made in your life. Those babies, they need a saved daddy. Those babies need a saved mama. Would you make that ultimate decision and say, Preacher, I want to give God my life. Would you just come? Step out where you are right now and just come. We ain't going to talk about you. We ain't going to put you down. Would you just come and say, Preacher, I want to give God my life. I don't want to live in this world without this man named Jesus. Any notable day now, he can come. And I want you to be ready. Would you come this morning? Would you come? Would you come? Church, I'd like to see if maybe we could come and fill these orders. Let's just talk to God for a little while. Let's pray for our lost loved ones. Let's pray for our lost children, our lost nieces and nephews, aunts and uncles and cousins. Let's, come on, let's pray. Hallelujah, God bless you. He left the splendor.